There's been a lot of talk in this year's presidential campaign about crime, the police, and our justice system. Much of that discussion has focused on the 1994 crime bill and its impact on America's prison population. Lost in this debate has been the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, a law that has its 30th anniversary on October 27th. This law, not the 1994 bill, created our federal mandatory minimum drug sentences, which have proven to be an expensive failure. President Ronald Reagan signed the law, which received overwhelming support from Democrats and Republicans in Congress. The law was a product of election year politics and high profile tragedy. In June 1986, University of Maryland basketball star Len Bias overdosed and died while using powder cocaine at a party after he was drafted by the Boston Celtics. Within days, Speaker of the House Democrat Tip O'Neill came to Congress and demanded the passage of new harsh mandatory drug sentencing laws that would crack down on drug abuse and drug kingpins. Those who were there recall how little members of Congress knew while drafting the law. FAM board member Eric Sterling was a lawyer on the House Judiciary Committee as it was drafting the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. In the 1986 drug laws, there are two relevant numbers. There are the quantities that trigger certain periods of incarceration. And so there are the quantities and the periods. Both sets of numbers are completely arbitrary. They are picked out of the air. Two weeks before the 1986 elections, mandatory minimum sentences went on the books. Almost immediately, America's prisons started filling up, but not with the drug kingpins and major traffickers Congress had hoped to capture. In 1985, a year before the law took effect, 76% of federal drug offenders received prison sentences. After the law went into effect, that percentage rose to 95%, where it stands today. Judges were forced to send even addicts and first-time offenders to prison for sentences they knew were far too long. Some judges even resigned in protest. The act also created the infamous 100 to 1 disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentences. This indefensible sentencing scheme forced tens of thousands of people to serve extra years, sometimes extra decades, in prison. While Congress has curbed some of the excesses of the 1986 Act, it continues today to send too many low-level drug offenders to prison for far too long. Since 1986, the federal prison population has grown more than 400 percent, and the federal prison budget has skyrocketed right alongside it. Taxpayers perhaps wouldn't object to the billions we are forced to pay if we were getting the biggest public safety bang for our buck, but we're not. Designed for sharks, mandatory minimum sentences instead catch minnows. Each year of the federal drug offender sentenced, 93% played no leadership role in the offense, and a whopping 99% did not use violence or any threats of violence. In order to pay for holding so many low-level drug offenders in federal prison, Congress has been forced to cut funding for important anti-crime programs. Since 1998, for example, federal funding for state and local law enforcement has declined 76 percent, while federal prison spending has increased 45 percent. And mandatory minimum sentences haven't helped Americans just say no to drugs. In the last 30 years, our drug abuse rates have barely budged. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act has been an expensive failure. As it turns 30, Congress shouldn't celebrate it. It should repeal it. Visit www.fam.org today and tell your members of Congress, it's time to repeal mandatory minimums.